Let's go. Let's play. Jesus's rhetorical question, why do you call me good? And then his clarification, no one is good but God, would have absolutely no rhetorical force if Jesus was not distinguishing himself from and subordinating himself to God. This is a very clear declaration. Jesus is not God. Can you hear the argument? Same argument. Mark 10, 17 to 18. Matthew 19, 16, 17. Luke 18, 18, 19. The rich young ruler says, Good master, what good thing must I do to obtain eternal life? Why do you call me good? Why do you ask me about what is good? There's none good but God alone. Okay. So he's saying, see, that shows that Jesus is denying he's God. Now, I got this from IP Inspiring Philosophy. He's going to provide a response, but I'm going to go into a thorough response. So listen. So that is not a necessary interpretation of Mark 10, 18. Rhetorical questions can be used for a variety of purposes beyond just outright denying something. Robert Bowman Jr. and Ed Komoszewski said, Jesus was not denying being good. He was pointing out that human beings are not good. And therefore, since the young man who approached Jesus regarded him as a merely human teacher, he should not have addressed him flatteringly as good teacher. If anything, Jesus' statement in context implies that Jesus is more than human, since Jesus goes on to summon the young man to follow him in order to be complete. Jesus' rhetorical okay, question, why do you call me good? And then his clarification, no one is good but God, would have absolutely no... He looks demonized, doesn't he? Have you noticed something common about these anti-Trinitarians, these blasphemers who worship false gods and goddesses? They look deranged. They look demented. They look evil. They look vile wicked rhetorical force if jesus was not distinguishing himself from and subordinating himself to god this is a very clear declaration jesus is not god okay let's begin the response are you ready are you guys ready you guys ready for the response you guys i'm just going over stuff we've done millions of times but preach repetition so I don't want to start anything new for now. So let me enlarge it. Let's address it. Here you're going to learn how not to interpret the Bible, how to interpret the Bible, and you're going to learn context. Okay. Right off the bat, let's start Legacy Standard Bible. All right. All right. So let's open up Mark 10, 17 to 30. We're going to, let's see the Mark inversion. Okay. Here we go. Are we ready? And then we're going to go into Ahmed Didat. If it's large enough, I hope it is. Let me make it a little larger so you can see. Because some people say they want to see my face while they see the screen. Now, I've done millions of sessions. I have millions of articles on it. Just type in Jesus, God, good, or go to my answeringislam.info pages. All right. Mark 10, 17, 18. And as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and began asking him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, here's where the sharp anti-Trinitarian is going to try to catch you. The sharp anti-Trinitarian is going to try to catch you. Why? Because they don't just stop there. They don't just stop there. Because they go on to quote what the rich man said after our Lord mention the commandments that he had to do why do you call me good no one is good except god alone you know the commandments do not murder do not commit adultery do not steal do not bear false witness do not defraud honor your father and mother he mentions the last six of the ten commandments remember he's jewish he's under the mosaic covenant and we still accept all the commands of moses that our lord jesus bound christians to follow under the new covenant, under the law of Christ. So that's why you got to study the 27 books of the New Testament. But now watch his response. Let's see if you guys catch it. We must study the scriptures with understanding. We must meditate, not just read fast, read with understanding and apply it. So if you're not reading with the intent of understanding, you're going to miss these nuances, right? What do I mean? Watch what he says. And he said to him, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Did anyone catch it? Now, this is a class 
I'm going to engage you so that I can make sure you're getting it. Did anyone catch it? Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Who caught it? Who caught it? Kyle, focus and follow me. You're going to get the answer. Who caught it? We're going to need feedback, guys. It's a class. That's how I know I'm helping you. The Spirit's working through me to help you. Nobody caught it? If you, don't, if you didn't catch it, let me know. I just, I'm just i seeing hearing silence. What's What did you guys catch? What did you catch? Facebook, nobody got it? Good teacher, he dropped the word good. How are you not catching it? Good teacher, when the Lord tells him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. He stopped calling him good. He called him teacher. Come on, folks. You got to do better than this. We got to dig deep and focus and meditate. In other words, the rich man understood that Jesus was saying, don't call me good. Only God is good. Therefore, don't call me good. What are you guys not getting? Come on, brethren. It's right there. This is where they're going to stump you. This is where they're going to catch you, the anti-Trinitarians. This is where they're going to stump you, saying, see, obviously Jesus meant he's not God, and he's not good in an absolute sense, because only God is an absolute sense, because the rich man understood that's what Jesus is saying, and so he stopped calling him good. Now, how are you going to get around it? You see why you guys got to meditate? Focus. You see why you guys got to meditate and focus and understand what you're reading. So the rich man understood that Jesus saying, don't call me good because only God is good in an absolute sense. Now, does that mean he correctly understood our Lord? Well, the anti-Trinitarian is going to tell you, yes. Come on, Mr. JR. If you're going to ask me how to defend that, you know I'm going to get you that loud here, right? What do you think I'm doing? Now, can you ask me, can you guys help me understand why is this guy telling me how do you how do we defend that when the entire focus of this stream is how to explain? Why would you ask me that question, Mr. Jarrett? You know I'm gonna block you now, right? I'm gonna get you out of here. Guys, why would someone ask me how do we defend that when the purpose of the session is to explain and defend that? Thank you, Kenny Dayson. Lord, we'll be back on YouTube by Thursday. What do I do to this guy? Mr. JR, you know you got to go, right? You got to go, mister. JR, hasta la vista, baby. Okay. Get out of here now. All right. That's what you get for being that stupid and not listening. All right. So the question is. The question is, did the rich man understand correctly or was he mistaken and didn't get it? Well, number one, that right there tells you that he doesn't view Jesus as God. So here are the clues. Focus. I may only have time to unpack this. Here are the clues. Number one, the fact that the rich man no longer called him good teacher means he didn't get it. He dropped the ball and therefore does not view Jesus as God and <clears throat> worthy of the rich man to give up everything for the sake of Christ. Okay, are you following me? Because I'm going to go through this slowly. Yes, Lewis, we got to prove that. We know that. Brother Lewis, thank you for thinking you're helping me. You're asserting it. You got to prove it. And I'm going to prove it. Be patient. Because you just made an assertion. You didn't prove nothing. Assertion is not proof. Stop asserting. Let me do my job, Lewis. All right? So 
Number one, by him not calling him good teacher shows he doesn't think he's God. Now, why is that going to be crucial? Because if Jesus is God and you believe it, you have to give up everything for Jesus, even your own life, if you have to. But by no longer calling him good teacher, he now assumes, well, Jesus can't be God. Therefore, he can't be absolutely good. Therefore, I'll stop calling him good. And so when the Lord tells him, you want to be perfect? You got to give up everything, your riches, give to the poor, give it all up for me and follow me. He wasn't willing to do it here. And he said to him, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. I've done all these commandments, done it all. And looking at him, Jesus loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, you still lack one thing. You want to be perfect? You want eternal life? You lack one thing. Go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. That's what you lack. You got to give up your riches, give it to the poor. For my sake, give it all up and follow me. Well, because he doesn't think he's God, he's not willing to do it. But at these words, he was saddened. And he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. See, this is the clue. You understand the clue? The clue is that Mark is showing you the man didn't get it. The man doesn't believe Jesus is God, which is why he's not willing to give up everything, even his money and property for Jesus. Because if he was convinced Jesus is God, he would give it all up for his sake. Right? Everyone got it so far? Because I'm going to prove to you our Lord was not denying he's God. But I just want you to see these are the hints in the text that you, by the illumination of the Spirit, are supposed to pick up. Okay, good teacher. Well, only God is good. All right, then. I'll just call you teacher, which means I don't think you're God. Well, because I don't think you're God, I'm not willing to give up my idol, my love and lust for money for you. Because I love my money more than I love you. Did anyone caught it? And I'm going to go deeper. I may only be able to do this. I may not be able to get to D-Dot because I got to go live on TikTok. But we'll get to D-Dot. All right. Secondly, how do I know? How do I know that? Jesus is not denying his essential goodness, and therefore he's not denying he's God. Here's where Christians drop the ball and got, have to get on the ball. Mark 10 is near the end of the gospel. Amen, Kirilesun. Meaning, I don't take certain verses from the midst of a chapter that comes from the middle of the book and ignore all those chapters that preceded it. Mark has already told me a lot about who Jesus is and what he's all about in the previous nine chapters so that I can then properly understand the point of Mark 10, 17, 18 and not misinterpret it. You with me there? Do you understand? The problem with Christians is we don't know how to do exegesis. What do I mean? Mark 10 is not Mark 1. Mark 10 is not Mark 1. Mark 10 is nine chapters later. That means you must have thoroughly read and understood the first nine chapters so that when you get to Mark 10, you won't misinterpret it. And that's our fault because we don't know our Bibles and we're lazy. Right? What do I mean? If I start with Mark 1 and I read Mark 1, Mark has already told me that Jesus is absolutely pure, holy, because he's Yahweh God in the flesh. So are you ready for me to unpack it? He already began chapter 1 by identifying Christ as the holy, pure Son of God who's the God of Israel coming in the flesh. Are you ready for that? May the Lord strengthen my throat. Good number. It says 333. 
Are we ready for that? So are you learning how not to interpret the Bible? You don't take Mark 10, 17, 18, isolate it from the chapters before and the chapters afterwards in order to misinterpret it. All right, now let's go. Let me show you. Let's start at Mark 1. Mark 1. Let's see. Number one, let me skip to the Lord casting out a demon. Mark 1, 21, 27. We're going to have a lot of meat. Stuff I've already covered, but we're creatures of repetition. All right. Notice what the demoniac says about our Lord. Mark 1, 21, 27. Okay. But read. We're going to focus on 24. They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and began to teach. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What do we have to do with you, Jesus the Nazarene? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now let's unpack that. Number one, this demon is seeing Jesus for the first time on earth. This is their first earthly encounter. But do you see that though the demon is seeing Christ for the first time on earth, he already knows who he is? He already knows him? He knows he has the power to destroy him, and he knows he's the Holy One of God. Does that sound like someone who's less than absolutely good? Are you serious? Does that sound like someone who's less than absolutely good? Really? Now notice the de demoniac already knows who he is. And he is afraid. He's stricken with horror and dread. And he knows he's powerless against Jesus. And Christ can destroy him. And he's the, whole, and he's the only one of God. I want to make a connection with James 2.19. And Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet, come out of him. And immediately, look what happened. Throwing him into convulsions. The unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. Now the people were shocked at Jesus' power over the demoniac and the demoniac knowing who he was and being afraid of him. And they were all amazed so that they were, they were arguing among themselves saying, what is this? They're astonished that we've never seen something like this. Even exorcists don't do what Jesus did. A new teaching with authority. He invokes his power, right? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Who is this man that even unclean spirits fear him and obey him? Okay, everyone got it? Now watch the reaction. I'm going to ask you a question. So this is Mark 1. Do you think Mark wants you to then get to Mark 10 and assume that Jesus is not? Absolutely good. After all he's already said, watch, James 2, 19. Remember the demoniac? He is afraid, horrified at the presence of Christ, knowing Christ is the only one of God who can destroy him. Well, watch here. Watch here. Look at the demoniac's reaction to James 2, 19. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. The demons shudder with fear. In the presence of God. Well, that's the same reaction of the demoniac when he was confronted with Jesus. Right? Same reaction. He cried out, shrieked with fear. See the same reaction? Everyone got, everyone see that? The same reaction, right? All right. Let me ask you a question. This was the first earthly encounter between Jesus and the demoniac. But the demoniac already knew who Jesus was. How did he already know who Jesus was when he's meeting him for the first time on earth? What's the answer? You got to crack my neck, guys. One second. What's the answer? Can anyone tell me? What's the answer? He already knew who he was. Others did not. Humans did not. Recognize Jesus. 
They didn't know who he was. They thought he's just a man, right? But the demoniac knew who he was. Why? Yeah, Eric, God bless you, brother. I want to kiss your head. Because the demoniac recognized him from the heavenly realm. He knew this was the son of God who would destroy the demons at the appointed time. You got it, Eric. God bless you, brother. You made me proud. That's what I want. I want you to learn. Because when you learn, you're going to share with others. In other words, demons see beyond the physical shell. They can see the inner person. And though others saw a human being, a flesh and blood Jew, they saw the inner person and they recognized that is the Holy Son of God, the one from heaven who has the power to destroy us. You understand? Do you understand that? In fact, here, let me prove it to you if you guys think I'm lying. Here's another incident. We're going to go deep. I don't think I'm going to get to the dot. The legion, when they saw the Lord, Mark 5, 6 to 7. And seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him and crying out, with, shrieking with horror. What do I have to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I implore you by God, do not torment me. See, they already knew who he was. And then the demoniacs, these legion, knew he was the one assigned to destroy them at the appointed time. Here, Matthew 8, 28, 29. Matthew 8, 28, 29. Watch here. So far with me, everyone? Matthew 8, 28 to 29. And when he came to the other side, remember, they're encountering him for the first time on earth, into the region of the Gadarenes. Two men who were demon-possessed met him as they were coming out of tombs. They were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. Now notice, no human power, no human authority, no chains could constrain them. And Jesus effortless, effortlessly without lifting a finger, just by his word, is striking terror into their hearts. Look. And behold, they cry out saying, what do we have to do with you, son of God? Here, watch. Have you come here to torment us before the time? See, they knew who he was. See, they knew who he was. They knew there is a time appointed where he is the one who's going to destroy us. But it's not that time. So why are you here? Why are you here? Everyone getting it? But then here's what's beautiful. If you read the Gospel of Mark, here's I want to challenge you guys to do me a favor today. You have homework. I want you to read the entire Gospel of Mark slowly, 16 chapters. Are you aware that in the Gospel of Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, you know who are the first ones to recognize that Jesus is Son of God? You know, in Mark, if you read Mark 1 all the way to chapter 16, we have God the Father, when Jesus comes out of the water, speaking audibly, and John the Baptist hearing it, saying, you are my son whom I love, with you I will please. Are you aware that if you read the Gospel of Mark, Apart from the baptismal scene, the first ones to confess that Jesus is the Son of God are the demoniacs. The demons are the first in, God, in Mark's gospel to confess and recognize that he's the Son of God. And the only place in Mark that you find a human confessing that Jesus is the Son of God is the centurion. And Mark 15, 39, after Jesus died. Do you know that? Let me repeat it again. Here you have homework to prove me wrong. The first human in the Gospel of Mark to be recorded as confessing Jesus is the Son of God is the centurion in Mark 15, 39, after Jesus dies. 
let me repeat. I'm talking about humans confessing. The first human to confess that Jesus, Son of God, was the centurion when Christ died on the cross in Mark 15, 39. And this is the first human in God, Mark's gospel to confess. And that doesn't mean there weren't others before the centurion that confessed Jesus is the Son of God. Because we know Peter did and others. But in Mark, he doesn't record their confession. In Mark, you will not have Mark recording Peter or disciples confessing Jesus as the Son of God. Not because they didn't do so. Mark just didn't record that. The first person that Mark records as confessing Jesus Son of God is a centurion. No, not that man, um, manual. No, it's much more complicated than that. It's not that the Gentile, no. Because even in Mark, in the transfiguration, Mark 9, verses 2 to 7, God the Father says to Peter, James, and John, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Okay, everyone got it, right, so far? Let me repeat the theme, the point. Let me repeat the theme, the point. The first entities to verbally confess that Jesus, Son of God, in Mark's gospel, are the demons. Here, Mark 3, 11 and 12. Then I'm going to show you where God the Father confesses Jesus in front of Peter, James, and John. But we don't have Mark recording any of their confession. The first Human to confess, and Mark's gospel is a centurion here. <clears throat> the <clears throat> Mark 3, 11 and 12. And whenever the unclean spirits were seeing him, whenever, right? Anytime the spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and cry out, shouting, saying, you are the son of God. And he earnestly warned them not to tell who he was. Now at the Mount of Transfiguration, the Father confesses <clears throat> to Peter, James, and John. How do we know? Because verses 2 to 6 say Peter, James, and John were there. Okay? Then a cloud formed, here goes the eclipse, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Mark 15, 39, the first recorded confession by a human being. And when the centurion was standing right in front of him, saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was God's son. Exactly, Sonia. Everyone got it now? Okay, now, how does this relate to Mark 10? Let's go back to Mark 1. Are you telling me? Sorry. Are you telling me Mark begins the gospel by showing you Jesus is the all holy one of God who is so glorious and majestic that demons recognize him and they are stricken with terror and horror and he's less than absolutely good? That's what Mark wants you to assume? You think that's what Mark wants you to assume when you get to Mark 10? All right, let's continue a little further. Mark 1, how does he begin? Now let's read the Baptist Confession. Mark 1, 7 to 11. And he was preaching, saying, After me, one is coming who's mightier than I, and I'm not fit to stoop down and untie the straps of his sandals. Number one, check it out. It was the job of slaves, of servants, to loosen the sandals of the master, master of the household, and wash his feet. John the Baptist just said, this man who's coming is so mighty and glorious. I'm not good enough to be his slave. I'm not good enough to even touch his sandals. That's Mark 1. Are you telling me that nine chapters later, 
Mark wants you to then assume Jesus is less than absolutely good. When the Baptist says Jesus is so good, I'm not good enough even to touch his sandals and be his slave. That's how good he is. Is that how Mark wants you to read Mark 10? Really? Everyone getting it so far? You can see the screen, right? Okay, my camera's off. I don't know why. Sorry. We got it. But now note the other thing John the Baptist says Jesus does. Watch here. John the Baptist says Jesus does. Here. I baptize you with or in water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Here's a fact, and I want you to refute me. There's not a single verse in the Hebrew Bible, not a single verse in the Old Testament, where someone other than Yahweh God, someone besides Yahweh God, pours out the Spirit, grants the Spirit, gives people the Holy Spirit. Jesus does what the Old Testament ascribes to Yahweh. He will immerse you with and into the Holy Spirit. Again, let me ask the question. You're trying to convince me that nine chapters later, nine chapters later, Hayden, thank you for your commentary. Try to comment less. Help me to help you just listen and engage me. Mark is now going to contradict all of this and present Jesus as less than absolutely good. So far with me? Yeah, I think I'll have time for Ahmed Didad. I think we'll have some time for him. So far with me, right? Okay. How about we go on to 9 to 11? And now it happened that in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens. You are my beloved son and you I'm well pleased. So wait, Mark 1 begins by saying that Jesus will immerse you with into the Holy Spirit, something only God does. Jesus is so glorious and pure and holy that demons shriek with fear and terror because they know he's the Holy One of God. And John the Baptist says, this man is so great and holy, I'm not good enough to touch his sandals and be a slave. And here we have God the Father saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And you want to convince me that in Mark 10, Jesus is less than absolutely good? That's the meaning of Mark 10? Really? So far with me? Really? We got it or no? I can't move on if you're not getting it. I'm doing it for you guys to get it. So far with me? Right? I haven't even gotten to the home run. Bases loaded, home run. I haven't even gotten to it yet. What do I mean? I didn't even begin at the top. Now watch this. You ready? Let me show you now. Let's now cross-reference, all right? Watch here. Okay, we're going to have to do a lot of cross-referencing. I'm going to have to break it down slowly so you can get it. Watch here. Watch how fun this is going to be. You ready? The first four verses ends it. First four verses, it's over. Wasim, if I have to repeat what I've said 10 million times, what I said in the beginning, Wasim Rabbi, you're not following me. You're not listening to my sessions. Okay. Mark 1, verses 1 to 4. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So what is he going to say? As it was prophesied, announced. So what Mark is telling you is, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news about Jesus, was already announced, prophesied in the Hebrew Bible. So let me see if you're listening. According to the New Testament, not just Mark, they all agree, the coming of our Lord Jesus was prophesied 
announced, declared by the prophets of the Old Testament by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So what Mark is saying is nothing new. This was already foretold. I'm now announcing the fulfillment of what was foretold by the prophets. He has come and he is Jesus. All right. Now, look at the prophecies he quotes as being fulfilled in the coming of Christ. Behold, I sent my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. Notice, he's quoting Malachi 3.1. In Malachi 3.1, God says, I'm going to send my messenger, an envoy, ahead of you to prepare your way. This messenger, according to Mark, is John the Baptist. Are we getting this? Are we understanding this? This messenger of Malachi 3.1, my messenger, is John the Baptist. That's why he goes on to then mention John the Baptist appearing in the wilderness because John is the one prophesied by Malachi and Isaiah. He's the messenger. Okay, we got it? Let me know. Put a one or say yes if you got it because I'm going to show you who John was sent to prepare for. Okay? Who John was sent to prepare for? With me so far? All right. Let's see the prophecy of Malachi 3.1. All right, watch here. Remember, it's John. And we know who John prepared for, Jesus. All right, watch here. Behold, I'm going to send my messenger. Here's the prophecy. He'll prepare the way before me. God is speaking. So the messenger is going to prepare for God. When he shows up, He's going to let people know, look, my coming means he's going to show up. Who? And the Lord, whom you see, will suddenly come to his temple. Wow. And the messenger, the angel of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says Yahweh of hosts. So let's see if you're listening. The messenger will show up, telling people he's about to appear. Who? The Lord, Hebrew Ha Adon, Ha Adon. Two Hebrew words, Ha Adon. The Lord, He's coming, Ha Adon. And He's coming to His temple, temple in Jerusalem. Well, the temple belongs to God and no one else. And the words, the Lord, Ha Adon, are only used of Yahweh elsewhere. Here, let me show you. Therefore, the Lord, Ha Adon, Isaiah 124, same words. Who is called Ha Adon, the Lord? Yahweh of hosts, the mighty one. What did John say about Jesus? One mightier than I. So, who is Ha Adon? Yahweh of hosts, the mighty one. These words, the Lord, Ha Adon, those two words, whenever they appear, Always referring to Yahweh and no one else. For behold, the Lord, again, Ha'adon. And who's the Ha'adon? Yahweh of hosts is going to remove from Jerusalem, Isaiah 3.1, Isaiah 124, and Judah. Now, who's coming? Okay, let's see who's coming. The Lord, Ha'adon. And where is he coming to? His temple. Okay, let's see. The temple is built for who? The temple was built for who? Let's see. I'm going to show you the Hebrew in a minute. All right. Watch here. Let's see if you're making the connection. If you do, then it's over. I don't. That's it. You've destroyed this heretic. First Chronicles 29 1. The king, then King David said to the entire assembly, My son Solomon. Whom alone God has chosen is still young and experienced, and the work is great. For the temple is not for man, but for Yahweh God. Okay, we saw it. The temple belongs to Yahweh God and not a creature, not a man. And the words Ha Adon, whenever they appear, 
always used for Yahweh, the Lord, Ha'adon, Yahweh of hosts, Isaiah 3 1. Again, Isaiah 124. The Lord, Ha'adon, Yahweh of hosts, the mighty one of Israel. All right, but wait. When the messenger comes, he's preparing for the Lord, Ha'adon, and he comes to his temple, who happens to be the angel of the covenant. Get it sink in? Guys, are you getting this or you're not? Because I can't move on if you're not getting it. Everyone getting it? Before I move on? I hope you're being blessed and reminded, refreshed, and stirred. The Bible is Trinitarian. All right. And this is Mark, right? Okay. Now, to prove to you that these words, the Lord, Ha'adon, are the same words used of Yahweh? Let me show you. BibleUp.com. You go to interlinear. Here. Because I know you guys are skeptics. You don't believe me. You think I'm a liar like Muhammad and Allah. Here you go. Let's see what the words are. Here you go. Here you go. Behold, I send my messenger, Malachi, and he'll prepare the way before me. Suddenly, will come to his temple, Ha-Adon. You see? H-A-A-D-O-W-N. Ha-Adon. Hekelo. 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 His temple. See it? You guys see with your eyes? Is it large enough where you can see it? See how much meat there is in Mark to unpack? Okay. Now let's see if these words, ha don't appear in Isaiah 1. Because, you know, you guys, you know, you don't believe me. You think I'm still. Let's go to Isaiah 3 1. Because it's right easy. And then we'll go to Isaiah 1. Here. Isaiah 3 1. <clears throat> For behold, ha adon, Yahweh. Sabaot, Ha Adon, Yahweh Sabaot. Thank the Lord for all these free resources. All we do is pay for internet because we have no excuse to being biblically illiterate. We are spoiled, but the more we get, we are we are given, the greater our judgment. Everyone see it? All right, let's go to Isaiah one twenty four. Let's see. Isaiah 124. Therefore, Lekin, Naum, Ha Adon, same words, Yahweh Sabaot, Abir, the mighty one, Israel. Okay. So if you got it, I'm going to ask you a question. If you got it, let's go back. According to Mark, John the Baptist is. The messenger of Malachi 3.1. When God says, I send my messenger. That means John the Baptist is preparing people for the coming of Ha'adon, the Lord, words used of Yahweh, who would come to his temple. Well, whoever this Lord is, he owns the temple. Since he owns the temple, that means he's Yahweh God. Now, is it clear from Mark and Matthew and Luke and John and Acts that John the Baptist was sent to prepare for Jesus? Let's see if you're getting it. John the Baptist was sent to prepare for Jesus, right? Correct? Everyone got it? Give me feedback. It's your class. So you got to learn. But how can John prepare for Jesus? When John is preparing the Jews for the coming of the Lord to his temple, the one that John is preparing for is Ha Adon, words used of Yahweh, the Lord coming to his temple. Does that mean that John is confirming and Mark is agreeing? Jesus is the Lord of the temple, the Lord who owns the temple, which means Jesus is Yahweh God in the flesh. That's what Mark is depicting Jesus as in the very first chapter of Mark. So Mark is telling you in chapter one, Jesus is no creature. 
he's the Lord Yahweh coming to his temple in the flesh. And you have the audacity to skip all that and go to Mark 10 to show me that Jesus says, see, I'm not good because I'm not God. Are you serious? But it's we're not done yet. What about the other prophecy? So look what he quoted. The other prophecy. Watch here. Here's the other prophecy. Mark 1, 3. Mark 1, 3. Hey, buddy. You got to put down the pipe. What boot you from your YouTube channel, dude? I haven't been on YouTube. I'm on Rumble, dude. I've been banned. What a sinner you are, man. All right. Okay, see it? Watch here. Here's the other prophecy. Verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. This is the voice. He's going to be shouting in the wilderness. Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his straight his path straight. So he's going to tell people, get ready. This voice is telling people, get ready. The Lord is going to show up. Be ready. Be prepared. He's coming. Where will this voice be shouting? In the wilderness. Now watch. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness. See it? In the wilderness. Why? Because he's the voice that Isaiah said would appear in the wilderness. All right? Wilderness. All right? He is the one in the wilderness preaching, prepared people. Why do you think he's telling them, get baptized, confess your sin, because you're about to encounter God. You want to make sure you meet him <clears throat> repentant. So who's the voice? John, right? Who's the voice? John, right? He's the voice. And who does John prepare for? Watch, now let's read the prophecy. Yep, that's YouTube for you, mister. YouTube. All right, now watch here. Here's the prophecy. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 5. A voice is calling. What is this voice saying? Prepare the way for Yahweh, not a creature. Yahweh is going to show up in the wilderness. Make smooth and desert a highway for our God, not a creature. So this voice is saying, Israel, Yahweh, our God, is going to show up. Get ready. Be prepared. Let every valley be lifted up. Okay. And every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain. And the rugged terrain, a broad valley, then the glory of Yahweh will be revealed. They're going to see the glory of Yahweh visibly. They're going to see it visibly. And all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of Yahweh is spoken. Now, did we establish who John the Baptist is preparing for? If you didn't get it, according to Mark 1, verses 1 to 8, John prepares... For the coming of the Lord Yahweh, Israel's God, who was to come to his temple. Right here. All right. But now let's read it again. Now watch. Watch the Trinity. Mark 1, verses 1, 11. Notice Jesus is God's son, so he's not the father. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now, who is that messenger, that voice? John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness. 
preaching of baptism, repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the region of Judea was going out to him. And all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So notice, he's getting them ready. Confess, repent, be forgiven, so that you can see your God and behold your God in purity. Because he's going he's gonna to tell them who's coming. And John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and was eating locusts and wild honey. Locust protein, wild honey, carbohydrates, fuel for the body. And he was preaching, saying, after me one is coming who's mightier than I. You see how mighty? This man is so mighty, I'm not good enough to touch his sandals. His sandals are too good for me. I'm not good enough to be his slave. That's how mighty he is. And he's so mighty, he baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he's Yahweh, Israel's God. Hello? That's chapter one. That's chapter one, folks. Mark has begun the gospel by identifying Jesus, by identifying Jesus as Yahweh, God Almighty, who comes to do what only God can do. With me there? That's chapter one. And you think that Mark 10 is now going to refute what Mark has already established? Jesus, Yahweh, God, the Lord, coming to his temple in the flesh. So we see him visibly. And he's the son of God and the command of the Holy Spirit. That's your trinity right here. Watch here. Now it happened, and in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth, Galilee. He was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open. The spirit, like a dove, descended upon him. So notice, the spirit appeared visibly coming down on Jesus in the shape of a dove. So Jesus is not the spirit. Jesus will baptize you in the spirit. So he's not the spirit. And a voice came out of the heavens. You are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. He's the son of the father, and the father loves him and is pleased with him. So he's not the father, but he's Yahweh. So Jesus is the Lord Yahweh, Israel's God, who owns the temple, son of the father, companion of the spirit. In the first 11 verses of Mark, he's already confirmed the Trinity. In the first 11 verses. So you know why Dan McClellan, and do you know why Ahmadidat and Unitarians get away with murder? You know why? Because we don't know our Bible. Sure. Leave me a voice text. I want to hear your voice. You understand? Now, if you've already read Mark 1, now when you get to Mark 10, do you think for a moment Jesus is saying, I'm not good because I'm not God in light of Mark 1? Do you think that's what he was saying? And I'm going to give you chapter 2, and then we're going to wrap it up. I may have time for D dot. So I got to go live again. I'm not done. I'm going live on TikTok calling out Muslims. There's your trinity. Jesus, the Lord Yahweh, who owns the temple, in the flesh, becoming man, God in flesh, God man, eternal companion of the spirit, who will immerse you in the spirit, whom the spirit comes upon and works with, so he's not the spirit, the son of God, because the father says, this is my son whom I love. I'm pleased with him. Trinity, right there. Trinity, in chapter one. And the demoniacs, you're the Holy One of God who can destroy us. Come on, guys. This is not how to interpret the Bible. This is not how you do exegesis. But wait, we got one more. And then we're going to go back to Mark 10. All right, now let's read Mark 2, 5 to 12. Now watch. Watch here. Get ready, right? 
All right. Watch what's going to happen here. All right. Watch here. Everyone getting it everywhere? All right. Mark 2, 5, 12. Now the next chapter. Remember, Jesus is not good. He's not God, right? Okay. <clears throat> and Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Child, your sins are forgiven. Oh, wow. Someone who's less than absolutely good forgives sins. And that's chapter 2. That's eight chapters before chapter 10. Interesting. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Notice, in their hearts, why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Just like there is none good but God alone. Get it? If there's none who happen to be absolutely good but God alone, and there's none who can forgive sins but God alone, and Jesus is absolutely good and can forgive sins, he wants you to see that means I'm God. Hello? Hello? Does Jesus correct them? No, man. I can't forgive sins. Don't be stupid. That's not what I'm saying. Watch. Immediately, Jesus aware in his spirit. And I explain what that means. When it says in his spirit, God by nature is spirit. Man is flesh. When it says in his spirit means immediately in Relation to his divine nature as God, as God, he immediately knew this is what they're thinking. That they're reasoning that way within themselves. On watch. Said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your heart? So notice, he knew what they're thinking in their hearts. And he has the power to forgive sins. And he's going to do a physical miracle, which they cannot deny, to prove he can forgive sins, something you cannot verify with your senses. Here. Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven? Well, that's easy. If I say, Sonia, your sins are forgiven. Well, you cannot prove or disprove that because sins are not something you see. So the Lord is going to say, I'm going to do something you can see with your eyes, touch with your hands, and hear with your ears. I'm going to heal this man who's paralyzed physically. And when he's healed, that will be the proof I have the power to do what you cannot see. Forgive sins. But so that you may know, okay, which is easier to say to, to paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, pick up your man and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your mat, and go to your home. And he got up and immediately, immediately physically healed, proving he has the power to forgive sins. But that's something only God can do. So notice Jesus is not saying, I'm not good because I'm not God. Only God is good. No, it's opposite. If I'm absolutely good and only God is good, that means I must be God. Just like if I have the power to forgive sins and only God can forgive sins, that means I'm God. That's the point. That's the point. So that you may know the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. So he healed the man's disease, forgave his sins, and he knew what they're thinking in their hearts. He got up and immediately picked up the mat, went out before everyone, so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. You better believe it. Now watch. Jesus forgives sins, heals diseases, knows the hearts of men. Now compare that to the Old Testament. 1 Kings 8.39. Solomon praying to Yahweh in heaven. Then listen in heaven, your dwelling place, and forgive. And act and give to each according to all his ways, whose heart you know, for you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men. Hmm. Yahweh in heaven forgives sins on earth and knows, and he alone knows the hearts of the sons of men. Jesus on earth forgives sins and he knows. The hearts of the sons of men. Interesting. And that's in Mark 2. What else did Jesus do? He healed diseases. All right. Psalm 44, 21. Would not God find this out? For he knows the secrets of the hearts. Wow. Jesus on earth. Lepanto, good to see you, brother. 
A few more days, we'll be back on YouTube. Jesus on earth knows the secrets of hearts, knows the hearts of the sons of men, and forgives sins. Interesting. That's in Mark 2, 5 to 12. Psalm 103, 2 to 4. Psalm 103, 2 to 4. Bless Yahweh on myself. Why do I, my soul, why do I praise him, thank him? For who he is and what he does. And forget none of his benefits. Like what? Who pardons all your iniquities. Who heals all your diseases. And who redeems, saves your life, your soul from the pit. Who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. My goodness. Jesus redeems souls from the pit. Jesus heals all diseases. Jesus forgives all iniquities. And Jesus knows the hearts of the sons of men. And he knows that all in Mark 2. Here you go. Child, your sins are forgiven. Immediately, Jesus' awareness spirit, that they're reasoning that way within themselves. Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? And that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Rise, get up, pick up your mat, healed his disease. And that's Mark 2. Mark 2. And you're going to convince me that Mark 2, which shows Jesus is Yahweh God, because he does what only God does, forgives sins, heals all diseases, knows the hearts of the sons of men. That then in chapter 10, chapter 10, Mark is going to have Jesus deny who he already claimed to be and whom John confirmed him to be. Yahweh, the God of Israel in the flesh, Son of God, companion of the Spirit. You're kidding me, right? That's how you're going to interpret it? But now notice another thing. Watch here. I want you to catch this. Okay? Yahweh does what? Watch here. Same chapter, Mark 10, 45, but I want you to catch something. Okay, pay attention. To what our Lord's going to say. Psalm 103 4. What does Yahweh do? Psalm 103 4. And I'll be done with the rebuttal. Who redeems your life from the pit? Okay. Yahweh saves you from the pit, your soul, your being. Crowns you with loving kindness, compassion. Now watch. Mark 10 45. Same chapter of Mark 10. Mark 10 45. Same chapter. Mark 10, right? All right? For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. I will offer my soul to redeem and ransom many souls. That's exactly what Yahweh does. Who redeems your soul, your life from the pit. You get it? All right. But now I'm a little confused. Mark 10, 45, Jesus speaking, I, the Son of Man, did not come to be served yet, but I came to serve mankind by offering my soul, my life, to ransom many, to redeem many. But in that same chapter, when the rich man walked away because he loved his money more than Jesus, look what he says here. Watch. Because we're going to finish this part. And looking at him, Jesus loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But because he didn't believe Jesus was God, he didn't believe Jesus was worthy enough for him to give up his riches, even his life, for Jesus. Because he didn't think he's God. So he walked away. But at these words, he was saddened. And he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. Now watch. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, because they made their money, their God, an idol. Anything you live for, anything you work for, anything that consumes your time, anything that you love more than anything, that becomes your God. So money can be your God. Your looks can be your God. Your possessions can be your God. Your spouse, children can be your God. Your reputation can be your God. 
Idolatry comes in many forms. May God purge us of all idolatry. Okay? Listen. How hard it is, will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples are made as words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Now watch their shock and our Lord's response. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Man, that's impossible. No way in hell can a camel squeeze into the eye of a needle. Now, he's not saying rich people can't be saved. Rich people can be saved if they die to their riches and love God more than money. But that's hard because they put their hope in their riches. Can you imagine any of these Hollywood actors or these politicians with their millions and their mansions giving that all up to become a monk, to become a priest, to become a nun, to go live in third world countries? Now watch here. Watch this. Now the disciples are shocked. They're blown away. They're shocked. Like what? Man. Then that means it is impossible to be saved. Watch. And they were even more astonished saying, then who can be saved? What hope is there? Nobody can be saved. Now pay attention, brethren. Let's now tie it in. Okay, watch here. I want you to see now the implications of our Lord's words. Okay? Look what he says. Same chapter. Mark 10, 27. Who can be saved? Watch here. Looking at them, Jesus said, with people, with men, with humans, it is impossible. It is humanly impossible to save yourself. A man cannot save himself, let alone someone else. It is impossible for humans to do this. He just said it. But not with God, for all things are possible with God. You understand the implication? Only God can save anyone. A mere human cannot save himself, let alone someone else. That is humanly impossible. Right? See it here, right? Catching it? Here you go. With man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Only God can save anyone. Salvation is impossible for a man to accomplish, right? Okay, now explain this to me then. Okay, guys, explain this. If Jesus is less than good, and he's not God, and he's merely human, then can you explain Mark 10, 45? For even... The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life, his soul, his life on the cross to ransom, to redeem, to save not one, many lives, many souls. How is Jesus claiming to do what he just said is humanly impossible, what he just said only God can do? How is Jesus claiming that? Can you explain that to me? He just said, it is not possible for any man to save himself. But God can do it because God can do what is humanly impossible. He just said it right here. Who then can be saved? Then how can he then dare say, I, the son of man, meaning human, I'm human. I have the ability to offer my life to save not one soul, but many human souls. But he just said only God can do that. He just said only God can do that. Can anyone help me with this? You see how not to interpret the Bible and I'll interpret the Bible? Do you understand? You're learning how not to interpret the Bible and how to interpret the Bible. See, if I know how to interpret the Bible, it is impossible to include conclude Jesus was denying that he's good. Impossible. You got to be a liar from the pit of hell or blind to conclude that if I read Mark 10 in the context of all the chapters before and this chapter. In fact, 
Just the previous chapter. In the previous chapter, man. Right here in Mark 9, 2, 7. Look at the honor the Father bestows on him. Okay, watch here. Mark 9, 2, 7. Just the previous chapter. And six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, brought them up on a high mountain alone by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his garments were shining intensely white. He was now showing them his inner abiding divine glory that was veiled by his flesh. Now is radiating through his body so they can know his true character. As no launder on earth can whiten them. Meaning, you understand what this means? The fact that he's appearing in absolutely, perfectly white clothing. So white that even a launderer couldn't make them that white. That symbolizes his purity. Do you understand that? A white robe, a white garment symbolizes absolute purity. And this is the chapter before. If his clothing are so white and pure that you cannot even get it that white on earth. Impossible. And that represents his purity. You're going to tell me in the next chapter, Jesus saying, I'm less than absolutely good? You're kidding me, right? And Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were conversing with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let's make three booths, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to answer, for they came terrified. Then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. That's what the rich man did not do. So the father is telling everyone, even the rich man, listen to my son whom I love. So when the Lord told him, give up everything and follow me, he didn't listen. He didn't listen. Did everyone get it? So now let's break down the implication. Now we're going to understand the implication. Now let's break it down. And I can do this with Matthew, and I can do it because they mention it, right? Okay, I'm gonna, I'll want i give you an example from Matthew real quickly because I want to go into D-Dot for a few minutes, Lord willing. Then I'm going to go live again in an hour, Lord willing. In an hour, Lord willing, I'm live on TikTok, and I'll be streaming from Facebook and Rumble until we go back on YouTube, calling out Muslims. The Quran doesn't know the Trinity. All right. Now let's understand. And as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and began asking him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now notice, he didn't say, hey, I'm not good, dude. Don't you dare call me. No, he didn't say it. He's asking a question. Why do you call me good if only God is good? You understand the implication? Why do you call me good if only God is good? I'm waiting to be with you every day and do life with you. And I'm waiting for you to come visit me, pray for Baba's health, and Lord provide so I can provide for my girls. All right, now, this is the implication. Let me break it down. This is the only meaning of the passage. If you're going to be honest to context, the only meaning is this. Wait, 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 wait. Why do you call me good if only God is good? If only God is good and I'm good, that means you're confessing I'm God. Well, if you believe that, are you now willing to give up everything for me, even your own life, and follow me? Because that's the kind of devotion God demands, that you be willing to give up everything, your possession and your life and your love for God. So are you willing to do that for me? No, because you're a liar. You don't believe your words. If only God is good and I am good, that means I'm God. Therefore, you must love me more than anything. Give it up all for me. But you don't believe that. And you're going to walk away. That's his point.
Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. He didn't say, hey, don't come. Why are you calling me good? Only God is good. So if I'm good, you understand that means I'm God, right? You understand that if you believe this, you're going to love me more than anything, more than your life, and be willing to even die for me? But you don't believe that. You're a liar. How do we know? You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And here's the fir first clue. He doesn't believe it. He stopped calling him good. See the clue? This is the first clue. He stopped calling him good, which means he didn't think he's God. He actually thought he's just a man. Do you see it? He misunderstood the Lord. All right, teacher, see, you're dropping the ball. That's not the point. Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. And looking at him, Jesus loved him. See, that tells you Calvinism is from the pit of hell. Calvinism is a satanic doctrine. If the Lord only came for the elect to save, why does it say Jesus loved this man whom he knew would not believe but walk away? Because Jesus desires even this man's salvation. But now let me show you the response of the apostles. Watch here. I'm going to show you after this, but now let's finish it. Jesus loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor. You have church in heaven and come follow me. Now notice what he didn't say. Give it all up and follow God. No, because when you follow me, you're following God. And when you give up everything, even your own life for me, you're giving up everything for God because I am God. Everyone sing, you understand now? The proper exegesis of the passage. And may the Spirit fill us to practice what we preach and do what this rich man did not do. Now watch. Now the disciples get it. May we be like the disciples. May the Holy Spirit that filled them fill us. Because look what they say. Watch. And guys, I don't think I can get to D dot Because I got to wait for this to be then uploaded. So I can prepare another stream. But it's okay. I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. Now watch here. See if you're getting it. Now Peter began to say to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. Okay, we did what the rich man did not do. We gave it all up. Now here's Jesus' promise. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms. Now notice, he didn't say for the sake of God. For my sake and for the gospel's sake. Why? He is God. When you give up everything for Jesus, you're giving up everything for God. You're giving up everything for the Father, Son, and Spirit. Because when I love Jesus more than anything and give it all up for Him, I am loving the Father and the Spirit because the Father and the Spirit are one with Jesus. And when I give it up all for Him, I give it up all for them. That's the message. Facebook, you're getting it? For my sake and for the gospel's sake, if you have given it all up, accept, I will do this for you. You will receive 100 times as much now in the present age. I'm going to give you a new family, the church. People will love you and provide for you. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children farms, but also persecution because they're going to persecute you like they persecute me. And here's what I'm going to give you. I'm also going to give you this, age to come, eternal life. You will live forever, never die, and become morally incorruptible and dwell with me. That's the good news. That's the good news.